Hello, I'm Kevin Mathewson, uh, translator, sometime interpreter of um, Portuguese, Spanish, and French. Uh, we're in the Mangal das Garças in Belém do Pará, a kind of zoological park, nature reserve. Uh, welcome, you translators and interpreters. I hesitate to call you linguists, because when someone calls me a linguist, I look over my shoulder. I don't know who they're talking to, but uh, welcome to the Mangal das Garças. Uh, I'm going to talk today a little bit about my experience with translation, which I've been doing since about 1980. Borges once said that we spend all this time talking about the impossibility of translation and, and then we go off into rhapsodies about the wonders of Russian literature. Uh, and I, I think that paradox sort of haunts our lives. Uh, I'll say parenthetically we go off into rhapsodies about the wonders of Russian literature, but they're rarely about Pushkin. Uh, it's, it's not that it's out of the question to translate poetry, but basically, my understanding, no one who doesn't speak Russian can appreciate Pushkin. Another iteration of that idea is Gregory Rabassa's observation in his biography, translation is impossible. And yet we do it all the time. Um, so, uh, I'm, 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 I want to look at that a little more closely. Um, I began my work as a, as a translator in a tiny office in the New York's financial district in the beginning of the 1980s. Uh, there was a IBM Selectric typewriter and an ancient manual typewriter and one day they brought in a bunch of big boxes and cartons and wires and they brought in something called a word processor. And my job was to sit down at that word processor which produce translations at a rate astronomically higher than either the IBM Selectric or the, of course, the manual typewriter. And I would sit down all day and they would just hand me documents and I would belt them out on the word processor. One of my jobs was I would receive a shoebox of tapes uh, in the morning and just hammer away all day on the site tra dictation, site translations of an enormous litigation, a uh, lawsuit involving a, a German freighter that had capsized somewhere in the South Atlantic in a terrible storm. And the translator, translating from German, would speak the transcript of the trial in English into the, into the tape, and it was my job to transcribe it. Uh, I, I won't go into the particulars of the case, <laughs> it's rather involved, but this was an illustration of language appearing to become instantly another language, and that's the, the expectation that dominates outside the field. There's a kind of snap your finger and uh, you've made a transition from one language to another. That's far from the reality of our daily experience, but it's sort of the universal expectation. Um, and I had, a, I, had my, I had a supervisor at the agency where I worked, and he would give you a archaic lawsuit with expressions from the 19th century, 18th century, 17th century, uh, with handwriting that you could barely read, and, and you'd sit down to translate it, and you'd be sort of grappling with the first paragraph, saying, what century is this? What language? What region is this? What, what are we talking about? What does this mean? And you're, you're, you're just sort of trying to wrap your head around it. And after about 
uh, two minutes, he'd come up behind you and say, how's it going? <laughs> and uh, Mr. Desmond was not a translator. He didn't know a syllable of a language outside English. He knew how to keep translations moving, though. So he was very successful in the in the moving the translations. Uh, it's possible most of us have had an experience with some sort of Mr. Desmond who also doesn't understand that it's not an instantaneous process. My experience as a translator, I'm I'm quite omnivorous. I like to do. Um, Literary translation, though it's the hardest, uh, the hardest, the slowest, and the worst paid, and most complex. But I translate just about anything except highly technical matters that uh, I don't really understand. Um, my first experience in literary translation was a, 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 a assignment in college to translate. Garcia Marquez's um, Relato de un Naufrago, which at the time had not been translated. So I was intrigued by the idea of translating it and, and, and selling the translation. Uh, it's, it's the uh, 1955 newspaper account of a Colombian sailor who spent 10 days adrift in a raft uh, and uh, was later published in 1970 as a book. It was commercially translated in, in 1986. Uh, so in the mid-70s, I was working on the translation. And uh, it, you know, it, it was hard, but not too hard. It was newspaper, Spanish. There was a fair amount of expressions to look up and vocabulary, but, but it wasn't exorbitantly difficult. And, you know, I, I had to work more with a dictionary than I'd ever in my life. It was very cumbersome. Uh, when I was finished, it was one of the ugliest pieces of writing ever put together in English. It was, I was horrified at how unusable it was. How, and at the same time, uh, appalled because it was not something I dashed off in a few minutes. It was an enormous piece of work. So how was it possible to work so hard and get such dreadful results? It, it was obvious to me that I was never going to do this again. Uh, it was an interesting experiment, and that was enough. So I had no idea. All, all, all I understood was that what seemed to me was sh to, should be a finished product was a rough, rough, rough draft, and that was a, an illuminating experience. Um, another major piece of my own training, in, in I wrote my senior essay in college on translations of Don Quixote. And I'm, I'm not going to go into that at length, but I, I'll just mention, many of you may recall that the first translation of, of Cervantes, uh, of, of Don Quixote, um, of, of all, and the first one into English, was Robert Shelton's 1612 um, tra translation, uh, which has a sort of a checkered career of being very spontaneous and immediate and and overflowing with mistakes. Um, and there's an interesting sort of <coughs> background point here, which is that uh, Shelton did the translation, he says, in 40 days, like the Septuagint. Um, and didn't have a chance to revise it. Uh, and yet, his translation weighs in again and again against all of the, all of the later translations, Putnam and, and Grossman and, and, and so on and so on, even though it's just a rough draft um, and it's not revised. Uh, and and what, what that, to me, says is really that's how good it is. 
it's so good that even a rough draft with, with mistakes that just sort of scream from the page uh, is, is so spontaneous and so flowing and also so much in sync with the, the period. He's a contemporary of Cervantes and unselfconsciously speaks of all the pieces of that world that to us you know might be an afternoon of research to just find a single term uh, so there are those qualities of naturalness in his translation and immediacy and uh, you know the the problems when you when you look at a work like Don Quixote they especially that work uh, it's it's enormously elusive it's anachronistic and uh it's easy to get lost and it's 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 an artificial undertaking to go after it from our point of view shelton there at the exact same time in the almost the exact same world uh brings a kind of immediacy and and he he touches on the the, the problem that that Gregory Rabassa speaks of translation is impossible, but you know how are you going to balance accuracy versus flow of the narrative? And in flow of the narrative, it just it it sings like a bird in many places in ways that later translations have great difficulty in doing. Uh, so if you if you haven't seen it, it's it's very interesting to punch it up online. Uh, but, but this was, at the outset of, of my exposure to translation, these were sort of the two kind of defining uh, perspectives. One was that there was a possibility of great spontaneity and immediacy and, and involvement with the text that carries the reader along and is terribly flawed. Uh, and the other experience was to have produced a, a very hard wrought translation of a piece of journalism by Garcia Marquez that was almost unreadable. Coming back to the present and uh, Mr. Desmond, uh, you you see in in Don Quixote as well as in just about any text, you'll have the the difficult parts, but you'll also have a portion of the text that is simple, declarative, and essentially transparent and easy to translate. It's almost automatic, and and that automatic correspondence is what most people outside the translating world think of when they say just establish the, the correspondence equivalence and, and, and translate at the snap of the fingers. Uh, in, in, in reality that's, that's a rather small set of um, the the text in a, in, a, in a literary translation, there are simple declarative things that go easily. So, the a piece of the daily bread is this discrepancy between Mr. Desmond's impatience and uh, the image I have, frankly, is is. Those of you who are familiar with New York know there's a. <clears throat> There's a kind of an eternally rainy Saturday afternoon hanging over the Natural History Museum. And you, you, you come into the museum from the overcast sky into the darkness of the museum. You wander down the dim corridors, uh, labyrinthine dim corridors. And there's a point in one of the nethermost basements where you find a diorama of a of a sperm whale locked in mortal combat with a giant squid. <laughs> 
Uh, this is an old diorama. They've, they've, they've renovated it since uh, somewhat for the worse, I think. But uh, the, the, the image I remember is, is, is you go down into the dimness of the museum, down and down, and you come to a place where there's a, essentially a black cloud, and vaguely appearing in that murky cloud is the jaw of a, of a sperm whale and, and with, a, with a giant squid wrapped around it. And, and they're, they're, they're in, in mortal combat. Uh, but you can barely, in the, in the old version of this diorama, you can barely make out the figures. Uh, there's really very little context. It's, 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 not, it, it's not so much a natural event as this sort of titanic struggle going on in the depths of the ocean. Uh, and uh, it, it wouldn't really have worked if, if uh, Mr. Desmond prodded me for the progress report. It wouldn't really have worked for me to turn around and say to him, I'm a sperm whale locked in, con in combat with a giant squid. Uh, and yet, <laughs> that was my sense of the, the, the sort of the intensity of the conflict and, and, trying, to, and trying to square these circles and trying to, trying to bring things together. Around the same time as I was working on these other things, I, I, I translated a sonnet of Lope de Vegas. Um, o rota barquilla mia. <clears throat> it took me 12 years to do it, and it was a little better than the, the, the Garcia Marquez translation, not much, 12 years. But it, 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 come, it goes to the other extreme of this question. Uh, there's a very interesting interview with, with Robert Fitzgerald about his translations of um, Homer and, and Virgil. It's in the, it's in the Paris Review. I, I think it's available online. It's really worth reading. Uh, it's, it's Fitzgerald going into great detail about translating these poems. And uh, the first thing he worked out with the publisher was there will be no time limit on this. So it's, it's very much the other end of the spectrum from Mr. Desmond. Uh, but that's the point of departure for going into uh, that other universe of translation. Um, idea of 12 years to translate a sonnet, um, I wasn't working on it constantly, <laughs> but um, it's it's a sort of a cautionary tale um, that you know the the Robert Fitzgerald's idea of no time limit can gang a glay so to speak. Um, uh, it's 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 a pitfall of the artificial media like movie making or uh, recorded music where. In a sense, time is indefinite, and you can just keep repeating something until you get it right. And there are certain things that you discover are not going to get better. Uh, time is not going to fix it. Uh, and that's, a, that's an interesting lesson. So I, mean, I, I, I like Robert Fitzgerald's idea. I think it's, 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 it's for very skilled translators. Um, who don't get lost. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'll call repentistas, um, the, the other side of the scale, the, the, the fast-moving translators, a little more like you know, simultaneous interpreters, who are uh, in some sense instantly rendering, or seem to be instantly rendering their text effortlessly. Uh, I think, of course, of Gregory Rabassa. Um, Gregory Rabassa is one of those translators you 
look at his work and you think, I should have been an astronaut or uh, maybe a bank robber. <laughs> this, is, this is wonderfully felicitous, mellifluous translating. Um, I, I had a chance to hear Gregory Rabassa and Julio Cortázar read live uh, at Columbia many years ago in New York. I'll talk about that a little bit in the next section. Um, but we're moving away from, let's call it, the rebellion against Mr. Desmond and, and letting the world stop until the right words are found with world enough and time. And we're moving towards that, that kind of ambiguous confluence of, of two uh, domains, let's call it. One is the domain of the, the misconception of how translating works and the idea that everything can automatically, with a snap of a finger, be transferred from one language to another, which is the common view. And the other sort of overlapping layer of this is the translators who can seem to do that or who do that, they, they make that, that instantaneous transition. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit in the next section. For now, thanks for joining me and I'll look forward to seeing you soon.